Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Bill here with Scott, as always. How's it going? How you doing? Not bad. Welcome to the second longest day of the summer. Today is that? I didn't know that. Yesterday was the longest day of the summer. And now each day moving forward, I think we lose one minute of sunlight each day or something close to that. It's definitely the two hottest days of the summer Fuck so far in Pennsylvania. Hey, Jesus Christ. It was 100 today. Yeah. It goes from like 90 to 100. Like that 10 degrees can kill a man. Because <laughs> it's always 90. We're fine with 90. But yeah. 10 degrees higher and we're all crying. Yeah. All the cars are like on the side of the road, popped, you know, like something got too hot. <laughs> Whether the tire popped or the engine just popped. We're all popping. It, it's, it's fucking nuts out there, man. Yeah. I feel like people are going crazy. People are on edge. Especially drivers. Yeah. Or do you just mean drivers? Well, that's what I was talking about. But yeah, even, I mean, I'm not getting into fist fights with people in grocery stores, but like parking lots of grocery stores, look the fuck out. That's so funny you say that because as I was going to work, today uh this week rather there was more maniacs on the road i've seen <laughs> more almost collisions just this last week and i was like what the fuck is going on everybody's driving so angrily it's also full moon tonight do you buy in, into any of that i don't know man the field i'm in i do see changes whether it's impacted by phases of the moon or what like i believe in moon phases impacting people i don't believe in like Mercury and retrograde and all that astrological bullshit. What about turning into werewolves? <laughs> you ask if I believe in, was it lupinism? What, is that what it's called? Uh, Lou, Lou something is the, uh, the, the scientific name of turning into a wolf, yes. They bothered making a scientific word? It, you know what? That? They may have made it up just for sci-fi films. Lupitism. Yeah, lu Lupin something. Lupus? Maybe it's Lupus. It's Lupus. <laughs> Wasn't it the kid from Bad News Bears? <laughs> yeah, he turned into a werewolf. He had Lupus. I believe it. Well, how you been? Anything to uh, talk about before we kick off into some news items? Not only has it been a long day yesterday, and it's just been a long fucking week. I'm just tired, and I can't catch up on sleep, and maybe it's the heat. I don't know, but I feel like... This week's been so long, I feel like it should be Tuesday of next week. Yeah, well, look at me. I'm tired because <laughs> I just took a nap before you got here. <laughs> Doorbell rings, and my wife and I are taking a little nap. We're like, oh, shit. Why did the alarm wake us up? So I understand tired. Am I faking it pretty well? I chugged this coffee. Yeah, same as every other week. <laughs> Good. <laughs> then I'm keeping up appearances. There you go. Well, going through the list here, uh, no fuck up or reason. Apparently, we... We did a perfect show. Go us. Wow. Mailbag. Got lots of stuff. Mail, motherfucker. Got a, definitely got a response from Sister Michelle. Uh, told you we I would. knew that was coming. Yep. Michael Nesmith. I told her, I said, you're our uh, Mary Ann from Brooklyn. Remember her from the Stern Show? She goes, yeah. She goes, didn't they squawk hawks or, or crows above her voice? I said, yeah. 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 She goes, you don't think I have an annoying voice, do you? No. No, no, Michelle, I'm only kidding with it. She's all nervous now. I gave her a complex. Yeah, she said she hasn't talked for a week. <laughs> oh, my God. Just kidding. Uh, got, oh, Brother Steve wrote in. He, was, he liked some of our topics. It was just kind of riffing with me. Uh, Brother Dan said us a nice insult. Pretty much done with that guy. Cockroach Dan is his new name. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, so pretty much same as every other week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cockroach Dan. Wow. Not even going to honor him by telling everybody what he said. But that's it. That's all we got from mail. So we get to do a show about anything we want. Nobody's asking for anything. What's it going to be? Well, I was thinking we talk about Canon Films Group. Okay, I can talk a little bit about this. So people who don't know, they're like, what did Bill just say? Canon Films, the company of the future. Canon Films from the 80s. There was a, a certain time in the 80s where this production company was making some of the craziest, weirdest movies. And the story on how they were making these movies, like their business practices, is completely bizarre. So I want to tell you guys about Canon. I want to bring up some of their movies. And then we're going to play a little game. I know a little bit about Canon. 
Like I know Charles Bronson with some canon stuff, mm-hmm. right? Like Death Wish. Mm-hmm. And they did make like 17 Death Wishes, I think, or at least like four of them. Uh, but I know, not Death Wish 1. They're no, the kind of company they, that... They swoop in and buy like the rights to something and they like make sequels. Like S- Superman was one. Yeah, Superman 4. Superman 4. And the director that just passed away. Uh, I can't think of his name. Corman. Wasn't he part of Roger Corman? I don't think he was, but his style of filmmaking was a lot like some of the canon stuff that came out. That's probably why I thought it was them. But wasn't it owned by like Russian guys or something? We'll get into it. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, yeah. So I, I've heard a little about this, but I maybe I haven't heard about this. Ah, ah, he said it. He said it. So let's let's get into it. You got it. I love that segue. That was well done. All right. So I call this story The Cannon Group, Hollywood's Biggest Shit Show. So The Cannon Group, Inc. is a production studio that is no longer around. You probably remember the logo from the 80s. It was a hexagon. Yes. With an arrow pointing to the right, I think it was. Yep. When you saw the Cannon logo before a movie, you knew you were in for some great crap. <laughs> it, was, it was the... Uh... The LJN of, of Super <laughs> Nintendo games. That's what it was for movies. Yeah. Canon. That's perfect. Founded in 1967 by Dennis Friedland and Christopher Dewey, Canon's journey from a mm, modest production. Dewey. Dewey. Canon's journey from a modest production company to a major player in the industry is a tale of innovation, controversy, and ultimately cautionary excess. All right. So in the early years, Canon carved out a niche. By distributing English language version of versions of Swedish soft porn films. All right. <laughs> oh, Sylvester Stallone was one of them, right? Actually, I don't. Oh, I remember he was in a. a I porno. think it was him. I like, think it may have been Canon. Oh, I don't have that note. Oof. Ooh. I hope it's right. Could be next week's fuck up, or you right there. <laughs> So it says uh, a strategy that proved lucrative for Canon, but set the tone for the company's willingness to push boundaries. However, the 1970s brought financial turbulence, forcing Friedland and Dewey to sell the company in 1979 to Israeli cousins Menahem Golan. Maybe yes. I said that wrong. Menahem Golan, right? Yeah. Who was a big maniac. So they were Israeli. They weren't Russian. That's no. right. And Yoram Globus. Yep. So it was Golan and Globus calling themselves <laughs> Canon Films. I love that they were set up to push boundaries. Well, when you start with softcore porn, there's not too much further to go, you know? Pretty much it must have been a fire sale. (laughs) So these two guys come in from Israel, right? They buy uh, the whole thing for $500,000, and now they're in show business, baby. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be in show, like American show business. Totally. That was their whole drive. They loved American films. The problem was they had no talent, zero talent. They had no business ethics. Oh. I'm going to keep going. So under the leadership of Golan and Globus, Canon underwent a radical transformation. The Cousins implemented a unique business model that prioritized quantity and speed, purchasing low-budget scripts and rushing them into production. Always a great idea. (laughs) Such high-quality stuff that came out of Canon. How did they do it? They didn't do it. Everything was just absolute garbage. This approach yielded a plethora of action films and B-movies that resonated with the 1980s audience, including the popular Death Wish sequels. So oh, they, and Chuck Norris, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. now you're remembering. Yeah. So the Death Wish sequels, uh, which they brought Charles Bronson back, and a series of Chuck Norris vehicles like Missing in Action and The Delta Force. That's right, Delta Force. I like Delta Force. That was a good movie. I remember them, but I didn't watch them. I remember because I was into Rambo, and I thought everything else was a ripoff. I like knew that. Somehow I knew that. I just remember they put a bag with a rat in it over top of Chuck Norris's head while he was in the POW camp. And he like bit the rat and killed the rat. <laughs> and I was just like, man, this guy's hardcore. See, that scene, I can't say for certain, but is probably a scene where these one of these two producers would come in and just say, I have a great idea, and I want to see it in the movie. <laughs> Put a rat in a bag and put the bag over Chuck's head. Like, that's the kind of crazy stuff that these yeah. guys would come up with. Yeah. So people are trying to make movies, and here it comes the two uh, Israeli brothers, and are like, no, I don't like it. Do this stupid thing instead. Just picture these guys coming like, two wild, wild and crazy, crazy guys. guys. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of what they were. <laughs> Everybody was terrified of them. Like, oh, shit, they're on set. I mean, these guys were loud. They were grumpy all the time. They yelled at each other, like, just full-out screaming matches at each other. And then the next minute, they'd be, like, hugging it out. 
you know, there were those kind of people. Love it. Most people are scared of people like those two. <laughs> uh, it says here, can it even sparked a global ninja craze with titles like Enter the Ninja and American Ninja? You remember those? Remember all those ninja uh, movies that suddenly came out? Those I can't say I remember so much, but it oh. sounds like a complete ripoff of Enter the Dragon. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. You're, you're, now you're getting the picture. Now you're getting the picture. <laughs> it's like, but we already have Enter the Dragon at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While Cannon achieved some notable successes, including their biggest hit, Cobra. Remember that? 1986 oh, that with Stallone. Stallone. Yep. Which grossed $160 million on a $25 million budget. The company became infamous for its questionable business practices. So Golan and Globus were known for aggressively promoting projects that often failed to meet expectations or even materialize. This overpromising and underdelivering became a hallmark of Cannon's operations, creating a reputation for unreliability within the industry. Canon would literally announce movies with actors before the ink was dry. Oh, we talked about this before, I think, where, like, they would just announce that, like, oh, hey, we got a new movie coming out with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he was like, what? You got it. Or they take liberties and say certain actors are being attached to projects yeah. when they weren't. Yep. All kinds of things like this to try to drum up interest and try to get producers who want to throw some money into it. Sure. So producers who didn't know any better, they get sucked in all the time. They're like, this is my entree into <laughs> Hollywood. I'm working with Globus and Gollum. Whatever their names are. I think that's it. <laughs> and I'm going to be in Hollywood now. And then they just end up side, you know, getting to a, in bed with these two guys who end up screwing them over anyway. So the company's ambitious expansion efforts, which included purchasing cinema chains and film distributors across Europe and the United States, further strained its financial resources. All right. So now the company's going broke. So Canon's penchant for high stakes gambles extended to acquiring rights to major properties like Superman, right? Because they made Superman 4. Right despite lacking the means to properly develop them. Mm -hmm. Superman 4 is one of the worst put-together movies, and it's like you watch this and you go, wasn't this just a major block? Wasn't Christopher Reeves just like a huge star? And now the special effects aren't even done on this fourth movie. Yeah. Like, you can tell how different this movie is from the others in terms of budget. Did they reuse some of the scenes or something they from the did. other? Yeah, yeah, it was, I thought so. This is one of my favorite movies to watch with my son when he was young because we would just he was smart enough to laugh at the special effects, you know, where they just ran out of footage of the guy flying. So they took a still shot of like <laughs> and just dropped it with like a computer animation. <laughs> oh, God, it was like watching a color form. Remember the color form? Yeah, like moving a color form around and say, this guy's flying. Look at him. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> As the 1980s drew to a close, Cannon's financial troubles mounted, exasperated by high profile flops and overextended resources. They were always taking in money for new projects, which was being used to pay their existing debt. So they're constantly like announcing new things, trying to collect as much cash as they could, but only to kind of like take care of the debts that oh, they were yeah. already in. They were robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's exactly it. The company's precarious situation came to a head in 1989 when Italian financier. Isn't that a nice financier. Financier. I'd like to say it with a little bit of panache. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Gian <laughs> Giancarlo Peretti. All right, this guy comes in, Italian guy, took over Canon through Path A Communications. Again, I don't try to say these things out loud. I like to capture the spontaneity of me mispronouncing words like spontaneity. However, this change in leadership only ushered in a new era of turmoil marked by internal conflicts and continued financial mismanagement. So the final act of Canon's story was characterized by legal battles and asset liquidation. Peretti's tenure was short-lived and his ousting led to protracted legal disputes. Ultimately, MGM absorbed Canon's assets, marking the end of an era in independent filmmaking. So MGM swooped in. Does it say how much they bought them for? I don't have that, no. Do you think it made them a bundle? Or do you think it was just like, we'll take what we can get? I think it was like my divorce. I will take your debts and all your shit, and you get to just kind of walk, walk away. Walk away from Yeah, me. that's what I think it was like. All right. So they got to live out their dream. I mean shabbily but they were a part of hollywood yeah in a very mocked way but <laughs> so do you think that's worth it you get to live out your dream you walk away from it scot-free despite all the horrible business decisions that you've made and the horrible business practices you took part in you just walk away so you you had a career you have nothing to show for it except for some horrible b movies but i don't know it, it sounds like they kind of came out scot-free yeah i think so I was thinking about that with uh, McLovin the other day. Like that kid came into Hollywood, 
had a hit movie somehow, like just became the biggest star. <laughs> couldn't, you know, he got a couple other roles after yeah. that, but he couldn't maintain it. And now he's a musician, kind of living life as a regular civilian. I watched something on the YouTube and he's happy as can be. Like, what a great life. You came in, you tasted it. It's been, yeah. Fuck to it. But you still got to taste it. <laughs> you don't have the burden of having to be famous for the rest of your life. Like, you can now just kind of walk around and people don't really go, oh, you're McLovin. Like, you know we've what? forgotten McLovin. Yeah, but his band. Even if it's like a mediocre band, he's not gonna have a hard time getting gigs because the people are just like, oh, it's that McLovin kid. Like, we'll book him. We can market that. Only you and I really know McLovin. People know McLovin. Older my, my than kids us and know young. McLovin. We were at like five. McLovin. We were. At, yeah. That's not even the same guy. I'm talking about McLovin. Yeah, same kid. Same guy. <laughs> not McLovin. McLovin from Hawaii, right? It's a guy who wears a glove. <laughs> now, we were over at Five Below the other week, and there was a McLovin fake ID magnet. And my daughter goes, who's soon to be 10, she goes, oh, it's McLovin. And I was like, how does she know? How the fuck do you know about McLovin? It got to be the internet, YouTube, something. But McLovin lives on wow. more than you think. I guess so. Well, th that's even better. Have a little bit more fame than I thought he had. So he could. So he does get stopped in the street once in a while, but not enough to like ruin your day. People aren't throwing panties at him. <laughs> well, <laughs> would that be something? But I think about like uh, you know George Clooney. Like that guy couldn't even walk down a street without a fan recognizing him. That can't yeah. be a good life. That's why they live in bubbles. Some of these stars. So I got a list here of popular canon movies. I want to go through and see if you know these movies. I think they're popular. So I was curious if you also know these movies and then we're going to move into a game oh surprise game surprise game haven't done one in a while i will say movies that are on your radar that you think are popular may fall far short with me that's why i'm okay. <laughs> trying this all right all right number one the happy hooker goes to hollywood have you heard of it i've heard of it because i think i think we played a game before where you like gave me five movies and one of them was fake i think i guess the happy hooker was fake oh really i think so <laughs> All right, Enter, Enter the Ninja. We talked about that. Yes. I never heard of it, though. Really? You never did? I no. Think that's Michael Dudikoff. <laughs> you say his name, your voice has to crack. Dudikoff. Dudikoff. Uh, Death Wish 2 and 3, I wrote here. Breaking. Breaking? Uh-huh. Breaking 2 Electric Boogaloo? Breaking 2 Electric Boogaloo. Also a canon film. <laughs> Missing in Action. Uh, the Delta Force. I know Delta Force. Invasion USA, I knew of. It was another Chuck Norris movie. Don't know that one. No. Is that like Red Dawn? I can't remember at this point. Okay. Chuck Norris. <laughs> okay. It's Chuck Norris. That's all I remember. This was a time where people went to go see actors, not movies. Right. Especially Rambo type movies. Like we loved watching Chuck Norris types just destroy the bad guys. Sure. Oh, loved it. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Oh. Yep. So there's one where they swooped in. They said, let's grab the rights to this thing. Let's make a sequel. I love Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. It's silly. It's funny. It's yeah. got Dennis Hopper in it. And he's okay. over the top. Yes. yes. But it's so different from the first movie. It's kind of like what Evil Dead did. Evil Dead was serious. And then Evil Dead 2 was like a remake of the first movie. But funny. That's kind of what this was. Right. Right, right, right. Okay. Alan Quartermain and the City of, uh, I said it wrong, Alan Quartermain and the Lost City of Gold. Never heard of it. No, it was a total, total Raiders of the Lost Ark ripoff. <laughs> of course it was. What was the name? Alan Quartermain. Quartermain. And the Lost City of Gold. Damn. I think there was another one, too. Was it Alan Quartermain and the Palace of Very Bad Things? Probably. <laughs> At Rings of Bell. <laughs> Oh, I remember when oh. Masters of the Universe was coming out. I was so excited. That's right. Ca Masters of the Universe was canon. Yeah. That's right. So I, I'd probably have to say of these, Masters of the Universe is the canon film that's like the biggest from my childhood. What about Bloodsport? You don't remember Bloodsport? I do remember Bloodsport. That was, jo that was John claude Van Damme, yeah. right? Yeah, I remember this. Oh, Bloodsport's the one where... He's fighting, and the guy throws sand in his eyes, but he was ready for the sand shot. I think that was it. Yeah, yeah. okay, because he could fight blind. Yeah. He was trained by his master to fight blind. But we get to the point there where Jean-Claude is like another uh, Chuck Norris to me. Yes. Because I can't tell you the difference between Lionheart 
and blood sport and double impact. <laughs> well, I remember that. The that double impact where he fought himself. <laughs> Damn. But I do remember Bloodsport. The twin trope. And in Cyborg is the last movie I got here. That was also a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, I think. Hmm. Um, that one's less familiar to me. All right. So I want to show you something that I found on the internet that I've turned into a game. We were talking about how Canon would announce these movies. And sometimes they never even came out. <laughs> so the game that we're going to play is we're going to listen to some Canon announcements. And you're going to tell me. If it ever was actually made into a movie or not. Oh, I love this. All right, are you ready? Let's do this. Here we go. We're going to listen to the intro, and then they're going to talk about the first movie. Oh, by the way, the Canon logo, it is an octagon, but it's a C for Canon with an arrow pointing forward. Oh. That's why it's an octagon. Well, it's not an octagon. It's got six. Okay, that's why it's a hexagon. There you go. Look at you. Look at you and your algebra. <laughs> Geometry. I was just going to say, wait, that's not algebra. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Sylvester Stallone hits the road in an 18-wheeler and heads out to become a world-class champion. This time, he's fighting with his bare hands and going over the top. Over the top. Yes. Did that yeah, they made over the top. I don't know. I turn my head around. It's like it hits a switch. It's like a machine, you know, like like a like truck. That's great, man. <laughs> I remember when Over the Top came out. I'm like, this guy's the biggest star in the world, and he's doing an arm wrestling movie. It was a good movie, I thought. I actually didn't hate it, but I remember thinking, that's pretty stupid. But yeah, in the movie, he is a truck driving arm wrestler who, I guess he very much his father-in-law is or maybe ex-father-in-law very much against him having custody of his son and he's trying to win it big in the you know the underground arm wrestling yeah. championships to get his son back and the truck it was oh it was like uh the john carpenter movie that we love big trouble in little china it was like the Poor truck job cool. express yeah I remember he had like an like an exercise thing like posted to the back of his cab where he'd like yeah. pull the spring thing forward and that's how he trained while that's he was driving. He oh god, this movie was terrible. So yes, over the top was one hundred percent real. Remember he would do his like he'd be holding hands doing the arm wrestling and he would just find this new grip. Remember he would turn his hand and do a grip and that grip meant he was gonna fucking take the other guy down. I don't remember that much. Oh. I don't remember that part so much, but I remember he turned that hat around, man. And he was a whole other person i think i'm gonna have to watch this again <laughs> all right you ready for the next one dustin hoffman the academy award-winning star of kramer versus kramer and tootsie creates his most powerful portrayal as joseph labrava an ex-cia agent trying to live in peace while the mob prepares for war in the streets of south miami from the hottest novelist in America, Elmore Leonard, Dustin Hoffman stars in La Brava. I'm going to guess no, and you know why. Why? So for Over the Top, they showed, uh, at least the, the semi-truck, it showed arm wrestling. This just kept showing headshots of Dustin Hoffman and the cover of a book, and they're trying to put two things together that never actually happened. And I also love how they use, like, Kramer versus Kramer and Tootsie. Tootsie. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman. First off, is that Peter Cullen, the voice of Optimus Prime? Oh, maybe. Dustin Hoffman, the action star from Tootsie. <laughs> it could be. Yeah, you're right. This was not a movie that ever came out. Dustin Hoffman had dropped out. He's like, I ain't doing this. But we announced it. I don't care. You shouldn't have announced it. The, the ink wasn't dry yet, you dumbass. Do you think there was ever even like a proposal to Dustin Hoffman about this? Yeah, because I read about this one. Apparently, oh, okay. he did drop out. Like, he didn't care that there was an announcement. He's like, yeah, I'm not doing it. Gotcha. All right. All right, let's check out our next one. John Travolta. In Saturday Night Fever, he became an overnight sensation. In Greece, he became an international star. In Urban Cowboy, he changed the look of America. Now, Canon Films proudly announces John Travolta in his most exciting project yet. 
And that's it. They don't tell you the they project. They never even announced who it was. <laughs> oh, Dude, that's yeah. totally fake. That's definitely Optimus Prime's voice, isn't it? Yeah, it does sound like now it. Now that you for hear sure. it again. For yeah. sure. There's no way that that's real. It's nothing. It, yeah. It's a big nothing burger. It's a big nothing burger. They just announced that they had her for something, and they didn't even say what it was going to be. This might be the most quintessential canon thing I've ever seen in my life, because they're just capitalizing on all the success that this actor already has and provide nothing. Nothing. Not even a title of a movie. You're going to love this better than everything else he's ever done. <laughs> but you know they never had a story. At this point, they probably only had the actor saying, yeah, maybe I'll work with you guys. And they're like, that's enough. It looks like all they had were screenshots from previous movies. <laughs> all right, here's our next one. I mean, like, geez. Within this unsuspecting city, history's greatest experiment creates tomorrow's greatest superhero, Spider-Man, the movie. A live-action spectacular directed by Joe Zito, based on the characters created by Stan Lee. You like that Joe Zito-directed Spider-Man? Spider-Man, the movie. The movie. I'm going to say this is... I don't think that they had the rights to Spider-Man yet, but I think Joe Zito was probably brought on board to direct the Spider-Man movie. This is the Spider-Man movie that couldn't get made here, got passed around, couldn't get made by... Uh, remember, James Cameron was going to try to make a Spider-Man movie. Yes, yes. Yeah, so Spider-Man never got made until it did with Tobey Maguire. So this one, with canon, never launched. There was something with Spider-Man in the past where he was, it was live action like 70s, but that's okay. not this. So this was never even close to becoming a thing. Nope. All right. They just it said didn't it. look great. No, it didn't. <laughs> it didn't look like anything I was going to. It was just a still. It was just, they got a guy in a costume and they took his picture. And they're like, well, at least we got a picture. You, know, Let's... you talk about color forms. I think they just brought in the cover of a comic book. <laughs> Mentioned Joe Zito. Yeah. Uh, if only you guys could see this at home. Oh. What would you do if you witnessed a murder? Knew you would be next, and you were a 98-pound weakling? Who you gonna call? Who else? Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris in his first action comedy, Kick and Kick Back. A comedy with a kick. Kick and Kick Back. The Chuck Norris comedy. Did they make it or did they not make it? I'm going to say no. No, they did not make that one. I couldn't find any trace of kick and kickback. This looked like maybe Norris's version of like Kindergarten Cop. Oh, yeah, maybe. Like when like the action star does a comedy movie yeah. or a family movie. That's probably what this is. Yep. You know, Schwarzenegger just did Kindergarten Cop. What's Chuck going to do next? Let's do kick and kicked back. It'll be a smash. When did, when did Kindergarten Cop come out? Like 88? I can't remember. Wait, wait. That was a 90s movie, wasn't it? Yeah, maybe Kindergarten Cop is Schwarzenegger's version of kick and kick back. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Mitchell is a successful businessman. He's being blackmailed by a vicious porno underworld. But the mob is in for a surprise because Harry is fighting back. Starring Roy Scheider and Anne Margaret in 52 Pickup. Written by Elmore Leonard. Directed by John Frankenheimer. And they're really pushing this Elmore Leonard, aren't they? Really? I haven't even noticed. I've only That laughing. was the one that Dustin Hoffman's movie was oh, written yeah. by, too. I just get so caught up in just the voice kills me. Roy Scheider. I don't know Roy Scheider doing much else big. I'm going to say, yeah, they made this. They did make it. I remember this coming out. I remember the name. 52 Pickup. I like when they say, it. you never hear this said this way anymore, but in the 80s it was porno. <laughs> porno. Who says porno anymore? Porno. Caught up in the 80s world of porno. Uh, <laughs> I love that I'm 99% sure that that's uh, Optimus Prime saying porno. <laughs> Autobots, roll out and get some porno. From the master of suspense, Roman Polanski, the director who brought you the terror of Rosemary's Baby. God is dead! The passion of Tess.
the mystery of Chinatown. Get it, Jake? It's Chinatown. Now brings you a spellbinding new film for canon. Well, we have another uh, Dustin Hoffman on our hands here. We saw Chinatown. We saw Tess. <laughs> it's going to be better than all these. Rosemary's Baby. And then, At this point in time, wasn't Roman Polanski already around out of town for diddling kids? I don't know. Yeah, maybe he was. Maybe it would be uh, catted to be like, we'll resurrect your be, career. He'll come back. Yeah, just sign here. We're going to announce something with you. <laughs> we won't extradite him. Yeah, well, nothing came of it. <laughs> There's no Roman Polanski catted movie. In a mysterious, sleepy town, hidden by the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, the ladies are keeping house and hiding a most extraordinary secret. Housekeeping, starring Diane Keaton. From Bill Forsyth, director of Local Hero, Housekeeping. All right, Housekeeping. I think Housekeeping came out, but Diane Keaton was not attached to it. How do you know that? That's true. I It just seemed like from that commercial, knowing what I know of Canon, they had a story. She would had nothing to do with it. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. She dropped out. Yeah. I like the logo. It looked like House the movie, the horror movie. I used to stare at that logo in the VHS store. They like even took the, the same font and design of House the horror movie and made it housekeeping. Like, come <laughs> on, guys. <laughs> Christopher Reeve is John Fisher, a reporter who needs a story and finds it in the seamy underworld of 42nd Street. Now murder has Fisher caught between the courts and the street. Christopher Reeve in the action thriller Street Smart, directed by Jerry Schatzberg. How about that one? Street Smart. No, because they kept showing the exact same two headshots of Christopher Reeve from different angles. Yeah, I know. So if it came out, Christopher Reeve was not involved. It came out. Yeah, they just hadn't filmed anything yet. So they had to take his like publicity photo and just yeah. find fun ways to like dance it across the screen because they didn't have anything <laughs> so shot. He, he was in it? Yeah, that was a movie. Oh, okay. That really happened. I would have never guessed. <laughs> Acclaimed director Andre Konchalovsky brings Tom Kimpinski's electrifying masterpiece to the screen. Duet for one. Julie Andrews. Alan Bates, Max von Sydow, in Duet for One. This is like Canon's artsy piece? Yep, yep. I'm going to say yes. Yes, it did. <laughs> you know, I, I just figured out a trend. You can kind of tell, like, when an actor is at the end of their career, that's yeah. when they're going to do Canon. So when you hear Julie Andrews in the mid-'80s, you're like, yeah, yeah, she probably yeah, did a Canon. This so. checks. <laughs> this is all very good, yes. <laughs> In an enchanted forest lives a wizard named Rumpelstiltskin. He knows the magic, sorcery, and the secret of the name. Rumpelstiltskin, a delightful live-action adventure starring Amy Irving and Trevor Howard. Rumpelstiltskin, the exciting first film from Canon's children's movie tales. Magical stories come to life. Wait, that was for children? That was horrifying. <laughs> that actually came out, that movie. I believe it did. Yeah. This is like their answer to Labyrinth. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I love that, like, our new children's yeah. division. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a horror movie at first. Yeah, oh, that was, you guys can't see this at home, but they just take this little, like, shitty image of a little rumpled stiltskin and they just like phase it in and phase it out and that's, that's yeah by pixel like the pixels yeah. phase in the pixels phase out star wipe <laughs> oh my god i was like that's it <laughs> robert carradine a cop with a sense of humor a taste for trouble and a lead to the case that could take him off the beat Permanently. Number one with a bullet. This hit list is for real. That is a real movie. That is a real movie. Yeah. I only know number one with a bullet because of a rap lyric. Oh, really? Yeah. There's a rap lyric that cited that movie? Yeah, I can't think of what it was, but it's, it cited that title at least. And you can tell just by who's in it. Yeah. 
the guy from Revenge of the Nerds that hasn't been relevant for a good decade now, in number one with a bullet. <laughs> and I love the announcer. Like, the other one's like, in a world where things are shit. Here it's an upbeat. <laughs> what was he? I forget. I already forgot his role. An upbeat uh, He's news a- reporter is blah, blah, blah. Like, the, the spirit of the... Uh, of the whole trailer is a lot better than the other dark Canon stuff. Yeah. Canon Films presents a provocative new motion picture, The White Slave. Louis Gossett Jr. stars as the ex-cop who helps a young woman find her kidnapped sister in the sinister underworld of Istanbul, only to find she's been sold into slavery. Louis Gossett Jr., The White Slave. Screenplay by Sterling Siliphant. I mean, Lewis Gossett Jr. certainly tracks well with this kind of thing, but like the whole thing seems in poor taste, but I feel like it would be an 80s thing to do. I'm going to say yes. Very good logic, but you're wrong. Yeah, this one didn't get made. No. But totally would have been believable. Yeah. Especially with... A foreign country like Istanbul that nobody knows anything about. <laughs> yeah. Louis Gossett Jr. will take whatever comes his way. Like, yeah. hey, we got you in something called the White Slave. Yeah? Good. I'll take it. <laughs> you want to know what it's about? Nope. Wasn't he an Iron Eagle? Yeah. <laughs> but he was also an Iron Eagle, too. So, he was. Yeah, yeah. Which seems like it would have been a canon film. <laughs> it may have been. <laughs> America's favorite superhero explodes onto the screen. Waging a war on today's criminals, Canon Films presents a live-action version of Captain America, directed by Michael Winner. Oh, man. I want to say Captain America did happen. I know there was another Captain America out there. I don't know if it was this one. I'm going to say yes. Actually, you got me second. I was about to say, yeah, that's the same one, but maybe it's not. Right, because... Now that I'm thinking about it, I think the Captain America you and I are thinking of was a TV movie. Yeah, I think you might be right. Okay, it says here the film ultimately never got made due to issues re- uh, reacquiring the rights. So it must have been a different one. So yeah. Canon didn't pull this one off either. So oh. this, this fell into the same trap as the Spider-Man yeah. one. Oh, yeah, this, well. It's almost was a fuck up Good job. <laughs> Tim Madden woke up with a gruesome hangover. Blood stains in his car and a woman's corpse in his yard. He's looking for the truth, and the truth just might get him killed. Tough Guys Don't Dance, written and directed by acclaimed author Norman Mailer, based on his brutal bestseller. I've had hangovers like that. (laughs) With corpses in your front lawn? (laughs) Holy shit. Uh, The title's terrible. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say no, this was never made. It was made. God yeah, that damn one, it. <laughs> that one got made. <laughs> Francis Coppola and George Lucas present an exciting new film from the director of Koyanis Katsi. An astonishing visual extravaganza. Now, director Godfrey Reggio brings his creative genius to North, South. A dazzling look into two worlds touching, north, south, a struggle for mystery or mastery. North, south is the world in progress. North, south is the world we will shape. Godfrey Reggio, in collaboration with composer Philip Glass, bring you North, South. Presented by Francis Coppola and George Lucas. Surprise, not Francis Ford Coppola. Oh, interesting. I didn't even catch that. And George Lucas. I don't think they did anything together. No, this is bullshit. Yeah, didn't come out. North, south. I don't care how many times they say it, it didn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> with music by Philip Glass. Like, he was a, uh, he's like a, an experimental, like, yeah, yeah weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> like, real, like, new age type yeah. shit. Oh, I can see George Lucas being like, yeah, let's get Philip Glass to <laughs> go our movie. Because we don't know what we're making here. Yeah, we needed to be able to. <laughs> even that that preview or that trailer was so confusing. Like I don't even know what the fuck no, it was. I know, and it just looked like random clips pulled from like National Geographic. It looked like something they would sit you in front of a TV and prop your eyes open to reprogram yeah, you, it like did. Clockwork Orange type shit. North, south, north, south, 
African children video games. <laughs> like it's, it's so off the wall. That was weird. I don't know. <sighs> it never got made, whatever the hell they were trying to make. Huge, green, and hot-tempered. He emerged from the depths of Lake Erie, eating everything in sight. He made you melt just being near him. It ate Cleveland, a man-eater, and a lady killer. It ate Cleveland is a real movie. Is it? Is I, it think, really? I think so. I stopped doing research at this point. I was so exhausted. I was like, you know what? I'm going to let Scott decide this one. I've heard people talk about It Ate Cleveland. I've never heard of this. Let's, I really didn't look this one up. Let's find out. The graphic they used was a green Godzilla type thing with uh, boxing gloves on. It looked like one of the AI images. Oh, I got bad news. It is real. It never came out. Oh, it never came out. You were wrong. I got hot in Cleveland, the Cleveland show, the Cleveland kidnappings, made in Cleveland, nothing. Keep scrolling to the X-rated, the Cleveland steamer. <laughs> All right, our last one. A wondrous African safari brings young Ben and his guardian Joe face to face with Bonzo, the mischievous orangutan. A special film of a magical friendship. Ben, Bonzo, and Big Bad Joe. Starring Bud Spencer. Starring Bud Spencer thrown in there in the last Bud second. Bud Spencer <laughs> got thrown in there real late. That was like, ooh, this ain't going so good. Bud Spencer. Bud Spencer. Don't forget he's in it. I'm going to say bullshit. All right, look it up. I don't know. I told you. I stopped. I punched out. I'm seeing nothing about this movie being ever made. I did look it up. I'm lying, but I just forgot. So I can't find it. Yeah, I don't think that was a real one. All right. Damn that, it. I got to say, the ones that were bullshit were equally as stupid as the ones that were actually made. Yeah. Oh, it's so funny. That's so <laughs> funny. My favorite is when they just announced they have John Travolta and wait till you see this movie he's going to do called, well, we don't got a name yet. Well, that's a taste of what Canon Films was all about, man. That's it. Damn. Independent filmmaking. That's what that was called. And now it's all going away. It's all going away. We don't get anything like that anymore on the big screen. <laughs> Maybe that's good. Tons of that garbage is streaming on Tubi. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's move into some news stories. All right, how about this one? Arnold Schwarzenegger held a gun to producer's head while making The Terminator. This is from Slash Film. I like this story. This is the kind of shit I like. All right, so it says, the stories about The Terminator are legion. The studio initially wanted O.J. Simpson to play the title role, for example. Arnold wasn't actually interested in playing the villain. He wanted to play Kyle Reese. Oh. Uh, I'll Be Back almost didn't become a significant line. It, uh, it, the movie almost had a happy ending. So there's all these things about this movie. So now there's a new piece of uh, legend that came out about the Terminator. So it sounds like John Daly, one of the executive producers, was one of the first people Cameron spoke to after Cameron met Schwarzenegger, when Schwarzenegger was like, yeah, I want to play Kyle Reese. So uh, Cameron goes, well, no, I don't think you're good for Reese, but you're great for the Terminator. So maybe, maybe he didn't like that. Maybe Schwarzenegger didn't like that he was not given the role he wanted and given the Terminator role, okay? So nobody really knows at this point. And this is Cameron that told him this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, suddenly uh, one day Daly visits the set. Okay. And there's big old Arnold, right? <laughs> so it says here, let's just say Daly didn't have the best experience. Here's how Cameron remembered something Daly will likely never forget. So Cameron says the first time John Daly visited the set, it was the night we were shooting the tech noir scene. He was standing. Remember there was a club, the tech noir yeah. club. He was standing next to Arnold, proudly smiling and rocking on his heels. Arnold looked over at him in full Terminator wardrobe and his Austrian accent and said, John, every time I see you, you're always smiling. He then pulled a massive 45 automatic, which was a prop. It was a prop gun, but looked real. Jammed it under John's draw, and he said, personally, I hate that. John went pale and left shortly thereafter. He never came to the set again when Arnold was filming. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, writer goes, I have no idea why Schwarzenegger would do this. If it was some kind of power play move, an intimidation technique, a practical joke or what. But Daly died in 2008, so I couldn't reach out to get his side of the story. But I'm left to assume that he must have engaged in <laughs> the only imaginable response in that situation, which obviously is to immediately shit yourself. <laughs> then walk up to the nearest person and say in a monotone accent, your clothes, give them to me now. <laughs> 
That's a fun story. That's a fun story. The the headline was a lot more misleading than the actual outcome. Like it sounds like he just pulled a gun on a guy, like right. a legit gun. Yep. But clickbait for still sure. A funny story. Yeah. Have you heard about the kid from Stranger Things getting in trouble? No. All right. His career is over after Stranger Which Things. One? You listen up. Uh, okay. Another good one from our. Favorite fan of Wire, so you know this will read like shit. Uh, Noah Schnapp. Okay. Schnapp. Is it Snap or Schnapp? I don't know. S-C-H-N. I'm going to say Schnapp. Officially started his career as an actor in 2015 and earned his breakthrough after starring as Will Byers in the smash hit Stranger Things. So he's yeah. the kid with the... He went away. Bowl cut. The bowl cut. Yeah. Right, he, right. He went to the upside down. Right. Uh, da, da, da. Following which he received a lot of fame within little to no time. However, after becoming such a beloved figure to all those fangirls out there, it didn't take long for the 19-year-old to jump on the controversial road either. That said, things haven't really been heading in his favor lately, especially after he shared his unsolicited perspective on Zionism and the war raging in Palestine by Israel. The controversial actor made things even worse for himself by allegedly getting kicked out of a New York City club because he was reportedly aggressively wasted. Right? So this kid, you can tell, he's just oh, he's got a big mouth. Heading down a bad path. Yep, yep. <laughs> hey, man, don't say that stuff. It could ruin your career. Fuck it. I'm going to do it. It's one of those kind of kids. He's only 19 and was drinking underage, presumably because of the reason uh, his fellow club goers turned down his offer, making him angry. Oh, I don't know what they're talking about here. But all right. They're just talking about how he got drunk. Uh, 1.30, he got two out of hand. Da, 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 nothing else to say there. We got a kid here who is probably going off the rails, and the only thing that he ever really did great with was Stranger Things. I don't think he's got another movie after that. No. It's not even a movie. It's a show. But he's got nothing going except for Stranger Things. Yeah. And he's already acting like a diva and a, and a problem out there. And I love these stories. I love when, a, when an actor gets a little crazy. That's why we have TMZ. <laughs> This is the uh, Ezra. What's that other guy? Better than Ezra. The uh, Flash kid. Oh, yes. You don't uh, hear about him anymore, so somebody had to take his place. I guess you're right. But I would have never thought it would have been that kid from Stranger Things. He just looks so docile and peaceful. Yeah. So watch his career. He's going to be the next one to go downhill fast. You know, I heard that other kid, too. The one, um, I forget all their names. The funniest one. The Yeah, the yeah. one with the... Uh, D- Dusty Dustin Dustin yeah I heard like he's like I'm not really into this fame thing like I don't think he's loving it when that could be could you imagine like somebody being like yeah hey, I'm not into this fame thing I'm gonna just get out of it the kid was like 15 I mean I get that really I, I don't guess. I want to be famous every day I think about being famous I'm like how fun would it be to be famous kids hey I'm famous I want to wrap this up and pull a McLovin yeah, you know. and start a band grass is always greener yeah it's a great show but and they take forever to come out. You think yeah. it's still going to be a hit? Like when this next Stranger Things comes out? I kind of don't care anymore. Yeah, me too. I don't either. I don't either. It's a great show, but you take this long to put something out. It's like when Def Leppard would put out an album. It's like 10 years go by. And then they put out an album. You're like, I don't care about Def Leppard anymore. <laughs> and you got to work really hard to get me back. Yeah. And sometimes they can't. So this yeah. show is going to, it's going to be scrutinized, I think, because it's just taken so damn long. And they stopped focusing on the kids so much, and it was like more like the David Harbor and uh, Winona Ryder show. Yeah. yeah. All right, you ready for some quick bites? Do and then it. We'll wrap this thing up. All right, The Boys to end at season five on Amazon. Are you watching The Boys? <laughs> no, I never saw it. The end for The Boys is in sight. Series creator Eric Knipke announced today that the series will end with the upcoming fifth season. Season five will be the final season, he wrote on X. Always my plan. I just had to be cagey till I got the final okay from Vought, which is a joke from the show. Thrilled to bring the story to a gory, epic, moist climax. Oh, my. Watch season four in two days because the end has begun. Season four has already started. I'm watching it. Okay. Yeah, we got four episodes out already. It's such a fun show. And it's the same show every season. It's exactly it's the same show. It's just superheroes acting poorly. Yeah. You're behaving badly. Well, it's a parody, too. Like, right. So one of the things that's happening is people are review bombing this because they're figuring out who they're making fun of on this show. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So Homelander is basically Donald Trump. I see. And the supporters of Homelander, who is doing things against Vought, and Vought represents, like, traditional conservatism, right? And then there's the other side, which is the liberals. So there's people that are like, oh, the show's gone woke. 
but they're the MAGA types who like don't really know what that word necessarily means all the time. So now the MAGA guys are. Well, like, I mean, honestly, the the goalpost keeps moving. The definition of woke keeps moving. That's so. true. That's true. Sure. So evidently, this season it got a little bit too obvious that Homelander is Trump, and now the MAGA types are like, "All right, we're review bombing it." So now the show's getting review bombed because they figured out that they were the ones being made fun of in the show. Yeah, but who cares? By season four, soon to be season five, like. If you're watching the show, you're going to watch the show. Yeah. I just think it's funny that they finally figured out it was about them. <laughs> like, I knew it by <laughs> it took uh, you long season enough. two. Yeah. I was like, oh, I see what they're doing here. That's funny to me. All right. Annecy attendees go loony for the day the earth blew up. All right. Annecy is a big, like, cons okay. film festival for animation. There's a new Looney Tunes movie coming out. Really? Yeah. It's called The Day the Earth Blew Up, and people loved it. It's called The Day the Earth Blew Up. What kind of title is that for a Looney Tunes movie? I've seen the trailer. It's Porky Pig and Daffy Duck. Is it like Marvin the Martian and like, uh, what was it, uh, Daffy Duck in the 21st and a half century? Yeah, maybe, maybe. The only thing I saw from the trailer was just like a, a small clip. It reminds me of The Day the Earth Stood Still. Are we going to see Gork? I don't remember Gork. Wasn't that the giant robot? I don't think I saw that. Really? Yeah, I don't know what that is. The Day of the Earth Stood Still. No. It's like a very, very classic sci-fi. Been remade a couple times. No, I've never seen that. Yeah. All right, I'll have to watch that for Gork. I think that was his name. I think the last one, the most recent version that came out, I think had in Keanu Reeves. I don't know, man. You're going to have to... Got to check it out. Send me, send me some IMDb links, would you? Okay. Sling some links. Okay. I just can't believe they think Looney Tunes is still going to play. Like, what kid can't wait to see Daffy Duck? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the last Space Jam didn't do that great, did yeah, it? Yeah, no. Right, it was a flop. You know, it is doing great. It's Inside Out too. Really? Fucking blowing it up. Huh. I thought it would be a bomb. I was like, no, no. way, nobody's going to want to see that again. Apparently, anxiety, the character anxiety, killing it. Really? Oh, kids are going nuts. They're in Happy Meal toys. Like, they're, yeah, it's banking money, man. They call the young generation the anxiety generation. There you have it. So now they got a spokesperson. Yeah, I'm not going to watch that. Uh, my son said he wants to go see it, so I have a feeling I'll be seeing it before too long. I used to love watching uh, uh, Pixar movies, even when I didn't have a kid. Right? I saw Toy Story, Toy Story 2. I loved all of them. Sure. But yeah, I'm, I don't need to see any more Pixar. Spaceballs. Sequel in development at Amazon MGM. Oh, I sent you this. With Josh Gad starring, Mel Brooks producing. I groaned immediately. <laughs> I don't want this. Do you? I don't want this if there's no Dark Helmet. If there's no Rick Moranis, it's not Spaceballs. Yeah. But the time isn't right for Spaceballs right now. I read in this same story, Josh Gad was supposed to remake uh honey i shrunk the kids it fell through but it seems like he's going after a lot of rick old moranis's properties. old stuff huh. so my question is in this new remake and he announced this by posting something i guess on twitter it was like a highly redacted script and it said oh just writing something from a mel brooks thing and it talked about like a starfield and people were like, oh, it's Spaceballs. And then he confirmed that, yes, it's a sequel to Spaceballs. The real question, will it be called Spaceballs 2, The Pursuit for More Money? It better be. <laughs> you can't just wash that light away. Yeah. I always like that joke. I like the Spaceballs toilet paper he was trying to sell. <laughs> the flamethrower. <laughs> but I just, like, that's the slapstick kind of stuff that, like, the scary movie franchises drove to death. Like, I, I don't think audiences want that right now. I do, and I think they're probably making it for us. Did you ever go back and watch the uh, Nick Kroll version of uh, History of the World Part Two? I tried. I did, too. I didn't like it. It just didn't land as good as the first one. That's why I'm saying I don't think this is going to work. I don't think Mel Brooks' humor is in right now. So, you know, we'll all go see it, and then we'll groan because we're like, ah, I wasn't that funny, and then nobody else will see it, so it'll flop. You know, I do like Josh Gad. I do. I mean, I like during the pandemic, he had that whole together apart. He would bring together like classic movie ensembles from some really, really big movies. And he had like a great YouTube channel. He's very entertaining. You know, he's murdered 18 people, right? 
Well, I'm okay with that. Um, but he tells a good story. That's all that's important. That's all that matters. But I, I also like the fact that Mel Brooks is still somewhat involved with it. I mean, he's still around. Does it stand up? I, I don't know. Can he stand up? <laughs> I don't know that either. Remember, I thought he was a referee. Yeah, he told me he was a football referee. I still, to this day, have a vision of watching him on the field and the announcers going, hey, look, that's Mel Brooks, moonlighting as a... And I guess they, if this really happened, it must have been a guy who looked just like Mel Brooks and I didn't get the joke and I thought it was really Mel Brooks. (laughs) I was like, how cool that he's a director and once in a blue moon, he refs NFL games. Oh, that's ridiculous. Not true at all. Not Not true. true. I hope he doesn't need money. That was a very early fuck up in this show. Yeah, yeah. Would have gone my whole life thinking that was him. All right, how about uh, a Ghostbusters cartoon coming to Netflix? Yes. You heard about this? I have. Netflix is announcing a partnership with Ghostbusters production house Ghost Core. Uh, bah, bah, the new series will be executive produced by Jason Reitman and Gil Keenan, co-writers of the most recent Ghostbusters entry, Ghostbusters Afterlife, which we love so much. Golly, can't wait for no, the cartoon. The, no, the newest one's Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Oh, right. Afterlife was like, the one where they did the whole Harold Ramis thing. Yeah. This is a new story, I swear. Probably just a misprint. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. In any case. You want this? I want more of the real Ghostbusters. That was a great cartoon. So that cartoon and what they make here could be the same. I mean, why not? Because the real Ghostbusters was based on the same characters they're going to be talking about in this cartoon, probably. Yeah, I'd welcome that. Although I don't like what Reitman's been doing with the movies. So, who knows? With uh, X-Men 97 working so well, I can totally see them going, hey, let's reboot the real Ghostbusters. Yeah, I'd be for that. Hmm. I looked at this and groaned. And then I went, with what you just said, well, maybe I would check that out. Yeah, I'd watch it. To me, I hear this. I go, oh, cash grab. (laughs) Well, yeah. Get Jason on the phone, if you don't mind. Let's let's try to talk some (laughs) sense into this guy. Don't water down... The Ghostbusters, they were such a great thing. You guys keep making these movies and all the shit. It's just going to kill the franchise. My best friend's kid fucked it up. Yeah. Twins 3. Yeah. (laughs) I was trying to remember who said that. Arnold. (laughs) Arnold Schwarzenegger, yeah. (laughs) Oh, my God. All right, here's another one. According to TVInsider.com, Tubi scores more viewers than Disney+, Plus, Peacock, Max, and Paramount+. Plus. How about that, Tubi? God damn. When wow. did Tubi get so big? I thought it was just for me watching 80s bullshit. Yeah, man. I saw it for the first time yesterday. It was just how stuff's made all day. Really? Yeah. And it's totally free, so I guess that's how they got there. I'm going to guess they had it on at this doctor's office because it's totally free. They just have internet connection, and they have a TV mounted on the wall, and they're like, well, Tubi it is. Yeah. And I don't mind it. Like, it's the commercial format. It's like the old yeah. school commercial format where all of a sudden... 20 minutes into the movie, you're going to get three or four ads. You know what, though? This wasn't commercials. It would just say, like, take a blink break, and it would be, like, a countdown for, like, when the show's going to come back on. It, no commercials. Oh, that's not but my like, experience. Ad, like, it would be like an ad interruption with no ad. That's weird. I thought the whole thing was weird, and I was like, what am I watching? And then it just said, Tubi, T-U-B-I. That's it, right? Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah, I was watching that uh, horror movie I was talking about the other day. Dead, dead. Uh, brain dead. Brain dead. And then all of a sudden there's like a commercial for like, you have some joint pain? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> try this cream. Now back to our horror movie. Self-lubricating catheters. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. All right, here's our last little news bite and the last story for the show. Donald Sutherland, star of MASH. It mm. says here, Clute. I don't know Clute. I don't know Clute. And Hunger Games dies at 88. Yeah. Why would they pick these movies? Of all the things the guy's known for, they pick Hunger Games and Clute. This guy's done a lot. I mean, I know things. him Animal House. Uh, Body Snatchers, wasn't that him, right? I believe, yes. Yeah, yeah, where he makes that big face and points. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I love that he named his kid Kiefer. Yeah, like, what should we name him? Kiefer. Keith? No, Kiefer. Queefer? Kiefer. I'm making up a word. I want this kid to have a terrible life. And until he finally got famous and everybody now knows Kiefer, it must have been a miserable existence for him. What's your name? Kiefer. 
Do you think any famous person's kid has a normal childhood, though? Uh, I don't know. I'll ask Dweezil Zappa. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> they didn't grow up going to normal schools. And if they did, like, people knew who their parents were. I love made up names, though, but Kiefer. Like, yeah. How did you come up with that? I hope somebody asked him before he died. You know, I'd rather have a made up name than, like, somebody naming their kid, like, a random word, like Apple. There's a kid named Apple. Yeah, you're right. Gwyneth Paltrow's kid. I think my kid goes to school with a kid named Riot. Riot? Like, Quiet Riot. Wow. Yeah. It's like, I'd rather have Dweezil. I think it's a funner name. I grew up with uh, twins. Their names were Hawaii and Sunshine. <laughs> Aloha. Uh-huh. Yeah. It, oh, God. They don't have a third kid named Aloha. They're doing it wrong. <laughs> So Kiefer, I don't know. I mean, Kiefer's not the worst, I guess. Kiefer's doing just fine. He had 24. Yeah, he's doing all right. He's doing all right. He got his, he got, he got his uh, social debt paid. I mean, every day. Spell Kiefer for me. I don't understand this name. Kiefer. <laughs> K-E-E-F? No. Oh, God, I hate my life. Isn't it K-E-E-F? I think it's K-E-I-F-E-R. Kiefer. Oh, man. Or K-I-E. I before E, except after C. But there's no C in Kiefer. Maybe it's a family name. What is it? Kiefer. I don't know. All right. Well, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about that name, or we can wrap everything up right now. Yeah, it's been going on pretty long. Let's, let's pull the plug on this one. Everybody, thanks for listening. Hope you learned something new. His name is Kiefer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bill, his name's Kiefer. So tell a friend, tune in. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next week. South.